Do what now? A little bail. A little, a little interpretation of bail. Yeah. yeah, I better sit down and start singing. <laughs> um, good morning. I'm glad you guys came today. Glad you're going to be a part of the service today. Um, we have a lot going on today. There's a lot of things that are not in the bulletin. Um, I'm going to try to mention a few. If you have others that didn't make it today, um, make sure you guys mention that. I will say this morning there's a, some beautiful fresh flowers up here. I don't know if you guys noticed that or not. I don't know if the person wants us to acknowledge them or not, but if you want to get with me later. Um, but um, it's, those, they're, they smell really nice as well. Um, today, Stella's going to be getting baptized, baptized right after the service. Um, so she's, uh, she's been excited about that for some time now. Um, yesterday, here in the uh, open gym, she was doing cannonballs in there. So, uh, <laughs> just to get ready. <laughs> um, I will also say there's the information in the foyer about the Reds game coming up. Um, the big thing you need to know about that is um, there's ticket information out there, um, but we'd like to collect the money by the 1st of August. That way Jim can go ahead and make the uh, ticket arrangements. If you have any questions about that, get with me or get with Jim about it. Um, if you have questions about the, um, the pricing of the tickets, get with us about it. Um, for some reason, if you need help buying a ticket, get with us about it. If we want to make sure if you're able, if you want to come, that you can come. Um, so get with me or Jim about that. Um, join us on Wednesdays. Um, you guys know we always have a potluck begins at 6, and then the uh, devotional fellowship begins at 6.45. The adults are in the fellowship hall, and the youth will meet in the basement. If you or anyone in your family knows anyone that needs any ministering this week, uh, Brother Danny is there, I'm there, my number's there, or any deacon number, you guys easily um, get that as well. Not too late to sign up for Vacation Bible School. Um, get with Brother Bill if you'd like to if you'd like to help out in any sort of way. Um, but that will we'll start marketing that. We've already started, so we'll start continuing to market that as well. Um, birthdays are there for June. Um, and then there's early birthdays for July, it looks like. Flipping over to the back to the prayer request. Does anyone have any additions, um, anyone that we can take off, or anyone that you feel like you need to give an update on at this time? Evelyn, Ms. Hines, she is sick right now. Okay. So, Emory, yeah, do we want to mention that any more in detail? Yeah. Um, for those of you that have been praying for baby Evelyn, uh, she had a uh, kind of a, a really bad night the night before and is not quite recovered from that. Uh, they think it could be some kind of a, a bowel obstruction, so just please keep her in your prayer. Obviously, being a premium, everything is an even bigger deal than normal. Uh, so keep her in your prayers uh, right now and today and in the next few days and keep posted. Also, uh, a blessing, uh, a praise. Uh, we have a newly engaged couple in our midst this morning. Anybody want to guess who they could be? <laughs> Keith and Laura got, uh, when, when was it, Friday? Uh, 24. 24th. Yeah, probably should figure that out. <laughs> yeah, so congratulations to them. Praise the Lord. How long did it take you to say yes? Yeah? <laughs> 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 you started to say yes? Congratulations. Gene? Thank you. 
Anyone else? Trevor.
church. Good morning. Good morning. That sounded pretty good, guys. That sounded pretty good. It's good to have all of you here this morning. For those who might know, not know me, my name is Danny Pace. I'm the pastor here at Plato Baptist Church, and it's a blessing to have you. I pray this morning that you will feel the presence of God. I pray that you will feel the fellowship of His Holy Spirit this morning as we gather together to read His Word and to dive into truth. Today, we are embarking on a new sermon series, one uh, that you might uh, find unique. I'm excited about it. I hope you guys will be as well. Well, uh, it's unique in that it's not a study that we typically have. It's not a particular passage of scripture. It's not a book of the Bible. It's not a Bible character. Instead, we're going to spend the next seven weeks looking at a topic that I'm sure you've all heard of, even if you're not fully aware of the ins and outs of it. It's a topic that some of you guys are going to find intriguing. Others of you are going to find it kind of scary, maybe even a little bit. Uh, but it's going to lead us to truth, I promise. I promise. Over the next seven weeks, we're going to be looking at the seven deadly sins. Everybody go, ooh. <laughs> That's pretty good. I can get you guys to do just about anything up here, you know? <laughs> the seven deadly sins. Now, before we begin, the first thing you have to do is you have to know what the seven deadly sins are. As in... Can you name them? What are they? Some of you, maybe you can. They are as follows. Pride, greed, lust, anger, sometimes referred to as wrath, gluttony, envy, and sloth. Now, shame on you if you just elbowed somebody next to you. Shame. <laughs> We're going to get back to those in just a few minutes. The second thing you need to know about the seven deadly sins is you're not going to find them anywhere in the Bible. They're not there. They're not there anywhere. So why have we all heard of them? Why is it that we all know or have a knowledge of these things when I mention them? Where do they come from? I'll try to keep it brief because we are on a time limit. Uh, but let me give you a little bit of backstory. To begin, you have to trace it all the way back to a monk from the early 4th century. A monk from the early 4th century. His name was Ponticus. Remember, there's going to be a quiz after. He actually wrote that there were eight sins, eight vices or behaviors that he felt like led to a life of sin or to a life of destruction. Other men accepted Ponticus's ideas and they expounded on them over several years, one of them being Pope Gregory I. Pope Gregory I found this list and he ended up condensing Ponticus's list. He threw out a few, combined a couple, and he threw envy into the mix just to make it exciting, you know. And, and then he boiled it all down to seven. The seven that we know today. Those seven that I mentioned earlier. Over time, those seven sins became forever linked with the Catholic Church, especially during the medieval church period in Europe. They found their ways into everything in their culture, into their art, and into their music, and into their literature. And eventually, the idea of seven deadly sins would actually influence Western Christianity as well. Maybe the most famous occurrence of that would show up in Dante's The Divine Comedy. Some of you guys maybe had to read that for school at some point. And from there, they just took off. And now they've become a part of our just mass modern culture. They're part of the world's zeitgeist, so to speak. And the fact that you'd be hard-pressed to find anybody on this planet who doesn't have some kind of an awareness of them or has heard of them, either because of TV or literature or film or mass media in general. Which is to say, I just covered about 2,000 years of context history in about two paragraphs. I'd say that's pretty good. <laughs> I'd say it's pretty good. If there was a passage of scripture that might somehow correlate to this idea of the deadly seven, it would be Proverbs chapter 6, 16 through 23. 16 through 23. I'll read it for you. A troublemaker and a villain who goes about with a corrupt mouth, who winks maliciously with his eye, signals with his feet and motions with his fingers, who plots evil with deceit in his heart. He always stirs up conflict. Therefore, disaster will overtake him in an instant. He will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. 
haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. My son, keep your father's command and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Bind them always on your heart. Fasten them around your neck, and when you walk, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. When you awake, they will speak to you. For this command is a lamp, this teaching is a light, and correction and instruction are the way to life. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for, once again, an opportunity to gather together in your house, in your name. Father God, we thank you for it. We do not take it lightly that we are here. And so, Father God, I pray, Lord, that you would just remove from our lives, from our minds right now, all the things that might try to consume us, consume our attention, those things that we have dwelt on all week long, those things that we know that we're walking into as soon as we leave here. Father God, I pray that we might be able to put them at bay for this moment, for this time, so that we can focus in on your word. Father, I believe that every single person in this room needs to hear this message today. I think it applies to every single one of us. And so, God, Lord, I pray that we be mindful of that as we listen. Father God, may we also ingest. That, that Father, may these passages that we read today, may this idea, Lord, may it be something that we do not just turn a blind eye to. But, God, may it actually be applicable and applied to our lives. May it change us. I pray these things in your name. Amen. Pride. Although there isn't really a set order of the seven deadly sins, they almost always end with the sin of pride. But that's actually where I want us to start this whole journey. It's where I want us to start because as the Bible says, pride cometh before the fall. That's not the best exegesis of that verse, but I think it will do. Let me tell you what I'm getting at. See, Scripture suggests that pride is the seed of Every vice. It's the gateway vice, you might say. And to be more specific, pride is the forerunner of all sin. In the book of Genesis, we're told that the serpent tempts Eve by appealing to her pride. Did God really say that you couldn't eat of any tree in the garden? No, no, no. God knows that if you eat from this tree, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God himself. The very first temptation known to man was the temptation to be God-like, to be all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-supreme. And let me tell you, folks, we've been chasing the serpent's lie ever since. In our pride, we want to be our own God. We want to sit on our own throne. And it would be great if everybody could jump on board. Pride is where it all began. Theft, murder, deceit, selfishness, hate, bitterness, materialism. It all stems from the belief that each one of us is at the center of our own universe. It's the greatest lie that the devil ever told. You can be God. In his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis wrote, Unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that are mere flea bites in comparison to pride. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. Author and revivalist Jonathan Edwards wrote, Pride is the worst viper that is in the heart the greatest disturber of the soul's peace and communion with Christ. It was the first sin that ever was and lies lowest in the foundation of Satan's whole building. It is the most difficult to root out, and it is the most hidden, secret, and deceitful of all lusts, and it often creeps in insensibly into the midst of religion. Jonathan Edwards. Talk about words of warning. <laughs> We start our series with pride because, like I said, it's where everything begins. But remember, 
Pride is just one of the seven sins. And so there has to be some kind of a practical reason for that. Why is pride listed individually and not just encompassing all of it? Why is it there by itself? Well, answering that requires a little bit of a language lesson. You with me, Joe? <laughs> Where is he? Oh, he had to leave. Well, darn it. I thought he'd be so proud of me this morning. <laughs> we'll just skip that whole part. No, I can't. See, Ponticus's original list contained two similar words. Hyperephia and kenodoxia. The first one is translated roughly as boasting. And the second one is typically translated as haughtiness or arrogance. When those two words finally found their way to quote Gregory... They kind of represented to him vanity or, or hubris and conceit. We'll talk about those in just a minute. But all of those ideas, Gregory thought, belonged together. They all encapsulate the same thing. And so he fused them all together just into one word, pride. But we've got to look at those initial words, those initial ideas, in order to unlock their intention. How did these church forefathers understand the concept of pride? Just look at those words again. Boasting. Arrogance. Vanity. Conceit. Haughtiness. An inflated belief in one's own abilities. In one's own superiority. In one's own significance. In fact, the word hubris, in case you didn't know, I had to look it up. It gives it an even better understanding when we talk about pride, because it literally means excessive pride or defiance toward the gods. Tell me that doesn't resonate with what we talked about earlier. Simply put, pride means that you have an unhealthy sense of self-importance, particularly at the expense of others. You want to go really into depth, throw a little bit of a God complex in there, and you got the whole picture. But I gotta say that I'm afraid that all those words and all those definitions and things, not only do they cloud our minds, but they lead us to believe that we can rest comfortable. Because pride sounds like someone else's problem. Listen to those words again, church. Pride is simply boasting. It's arrogance. It's vanity. It's smugness and conceitedness. I mean, when you look at the big picture, you start to realize that pride isn't someone else's problem. It's a me problem. It's an us problem. It's a sin problem. One that every single one of us wrestles with each and every day. None of us, none of us can get away from it. When our pride allows us to disrespect other people, we are in sin. When our pride <laughs> keeps us from Admitting our own wrongdoings, we are in sin. When our pride instills within us this feeling of superiority, we are in sin. When our pride affords us the ability to just simply use people to get what we want, we are in sin. When, when our pride causes us to reject correction from other people, we are in sin. When pride becomes a source of, of worth and of status for us, then we are in sin. When pride seeks out our own image over our holiness, we are are in sin, when our pride causes us to have friction and distance and separation between us and our Creator, we are in sin. So what do we do about it? How do we combat that when pride is built into the very fabric of what it means to have a sinful nature? By learning Humility. Humility is the opposite of pride. 
And anytime our pride hinders our humility, we cross over into sinful territory. It's that simple. Pride is always at war with humility. Whether it's the struggle within ourselves, whether it's the struggle that we have in interacting with other people, or whether it's our struggle with God, it's pride and humility battling it out. I want to talk about each one of those areas of humility, starting with humility within ourselves. It might sound like this weird foreign concept. What do I mean by that? I mean that we all need to have a truthful understanding of who we really are. And that isn't always easy because we live in this world that values pride, that encourages us to be proud, proud of our accomplishments, proud of our intelligence, proud of our past, proud of our appearance, proud of our opinions, proud of our words. And hear me, I'm not saying that there's never a moment that you shouldn't feel a sense of accomplishment in something. But scripture tells us in Jeremiah chapter 9, Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let he who boasts boast in this, that he understands and that he knows me. In other words, God says, if you're going to boast in anything, boast in the knowledge of me. And all that we are, and all that we've done, is nothing compared to knowing God, being known by God, walking in faithfulness to God. Nothing. We are taught to boast in so much. As if it was all our own doing. As if everything that we have and have ever done in this life didn't come from God, but it came from our own effort that we are responsible for it all. And that's directly against Scripture because Scripture tells us that every good and perfect gift comes from We have to fight the temptation to believe that we did it. That it's us. Which means that we have to fight the very notion that we are somehow this perfect being. That we are somehow without fall or fault. That we are somehow perfect just the way we are. That's what the world would want us to believe. But we are not. We are sinners, saved by grace. And the only value that we have is that we are created in the image of God and that God saw fit to rain grace upon us. Our value comes from Him. That's gospel. Romans chapter 3 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace. Through the redemption that came through Jesus. Not you. Not me. Not our best intentions on our best day. It is through Christ. When our pride overshadows our humility and the knowledge of who we are, we fall prey to the lie that the gospel doesn't apply to us. That we have no need for Jesus. Galatians chapter 2, 21. If righteousness could be gained through the law, that's being perfect or being flawless. And Christ died for nothing, Paul said. We have to humbly acknowledge the truth of who we are. The truth of our need truth of who God is and who we are. We have to be truthful with ourselves. And if we're truthful with ourselves, we'll begin to realize and know why we should be humble with everyone else. That's the second thing. Walking in humility with one another. See, when you understand that our worth comes from God alone, you begin to realize that everyone's worth is found in God. 
And so therefore, everyone is worthwhile. Brothers and sisters, this is even more necessary in the church because that's often where pride will rear its ugly head the most. You would think that humility would come naturally to us, that you, that you would find it within the church easily. But what was it that Jonathan Edwards said? He said, pride is the most hidden, secret, and deceitful of all lusts, and it often creeps in insensibly into the midst of religion. An inflated, prideful estimation of our own self-worth can foster this feeling of superiority or self-righteousness. And that anyone outside of this holy huddle, this holy thing that we've got going on, anyone outside of that is less than. That they're degenerate, that they're sinners, that they're the unwashed masses, and that we've got it all together. We should pray for them. Proud and arrogant is often how those outside the Christian faith see us. It's often how they describe us. And that is very, very sad, brothers and sisters, because that is exactly how Jesus painted the religious leaders, if you recall. Proud, arrogant, and smug. It's not the company that we want to be lumped in with the church. Philippians chapter 2 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ and Jesus. In 1 Peter chapter 3, we are told, All of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. And because of this, you were called. Jesus tells us in John 15, This is my commandment, that you would love each other the way that I have loved you. And in Matthew chapter 20, Jesus would say, Whoever wants to become first among you must become your servant. Who wants to become first must also become a slave. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for me. And just in case some of you scripture scholars out there are thinking, but pastor, those are all dealing with believers inside the church. How believers should interact with one another. Well, then look at Titus chapter 3. In Titus chapter 3, it says, Remind the people to be subject to rulers and to authorities and to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always be gentle toward everyone. At one time, we were too foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness of love, of the love of God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us. Not because of righteous things that we had done, but because of His mercy. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. I'll say it again. When we understand that our worth comes from God alone, we begin to realize that everyone's does. And when we recognize what grace has been poured out upon us, we are eager to lavish that grace on others. Grace should humble us. It should humble us before God. Third one, we're almost done. Scripture tells us that the fool says in his heart, there is no God. A fool. Listen, only someone so consumed with pride could even make such a claim that there is no God. Because it's a claim that no person could ever know for sure. 
Their truth is simply based on nothing but their own inflated sense of intellect. It's pride. It's untamed and untempered pride that leads us down the path toward Godhood. That throne we talked about. And when we are all at the center of our own universe, then there's no other purpose in this life other than to pursue our own desires and to pursue our own survival and to pursue our own salvation. Scripture warns against this belief. The psalmist tells us that this foolish notion only leads to despair and to frustration. James tells us in chapter 4, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. So therefore, humble yourselves before the Lord and He will lift you up. In Luke chapter 14, we are told those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. The, the fool will reap exactly what they have sown, a world that is void of God, and thus God's input and God's blessing and God's salvation. And where does that all lead us? It leads us to where what C.S. Uh, Lewis called it, the anti-God state of mind. And where does that come from? Where does that seed come from, that God-defined pride? It comes from a lust of this world instead of the next. A desire to have everything here at our fingertips now rather than what is to come. 1 John 2.16 For all that is in this world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and all the pride of life, it is not from the Father but from the world. It comes from this desire to embrace this world instead of the things of God. Because see, if the fool really believes that there is no God, then guess who gets to be God? They do. And if you're God, then everything is permissible to you. Because you're the sole determiner what's sinful and what's not. Pride runs contrary to humility. But humility is what God desires. And just as pride is the basis for all sin, humility is the starting point of all righteousness. It's fitting. Take my word for it. Micah chapter 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. I'll leave you with this. While the early church fathers were contemplating the bases for sin and death and the seven death of God had already given us a roadmap for how to defeat those things, how to overcome. You're going to hear it over and over again throughout the sermon series. Galatians chapter 5 is the roadmap. You find Paul's teachings on the attributes of the things that are marked in the life of a believer. They're often referred to as the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, those who believe in the Lord, those who trust and follow after God, you should see these things in their life as evidence. Galatians chapter 5 says this, that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Do you know what gentleness means in that passage in the context of that list? Humility. Those who are marked and led by the Spirit are humble. They are humble with themselves. 